Let's move along now to the first panel. Great. Uh, and uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the moderator and will the uh, participants, uh, Chuck Hilmerberg, uh, Dick Berna, and uh, Dave McNellis, please uh, take your places up front. <clears throat> So, the way we structured the conference is to have an equal balance of uh, keynotes and panels discussing various aspects of the major theme of the conference. Uh, and the first um, one is really critical to any kind of forecast with respect to credit markets, and that is what's happening in the real economy. And the economist's view of the relationship between the real economy and the credit cycle. So with that, I'll introduce Kim Schoenholz, who is uh, the moderator of this session. And uh, Kim is the Henry Kaufman Professor of History of Financial Institutions and Markets here at the Stern School. And he also directs the Stern Center for Global Economy and Business uh, Economics. Now, uh, Kim does an enormous amount of work here in organizing sessions very relevant to the re what's going on in the real economy, what's going on in the financial markets, and makes it available to our students and our alumni on a regular basis. Uh, the amount of work he does is incredible in this area. So I asked Kim to moderate this session, and I'd like to now turn it over to him for his opening comments. Thank you very much, Ed. That's a very kind introduction. Uh, thank you, Philip, and thank you, Ira. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you all for coming and joining us today. Uh, I have the pleasure of moderating today's panel on the outlook for the economy and the credit cycle, and we have three very distinguished panelists. To my left, Dick Berner is my colleague at Stern and the former director of the Office of Financial Research at Treasury. Charlie Himmelberg, to his left, is the chief markets economist and head of global markets research at Glo Goldman Sachs. He's also a former faculty member here in economics. And Dave McNellis is the head of research for KKR's global macro and asset allocation team. You can read their bios in the pro conference program, suffice it to say, their combined experience of nearly a century runs the gamut from the buy side to the sell side and from academia to the policy world. The setting for today's discussion is no less extraordinary. In Europe and Japan, roughly $15 trillion of debt carries a negative yield, including nearly a trillion dollars of corporate bonds. In some countries, the entire sovereign yield curve is below zero. In the United States, the yield curve out to 10 years is flat or inverted. At the same time, there is plenty of debt, both in stock and flow terms. In emerging economies, credit to the non-financial sector as a whole is at 177% of GDP, up by nearly 60, 60 percentage points from a decade ago. As a share of GDP, credit to US non-financial corporations is near record. While, according to the CBO, the U.S. federal government is on an unsustainable path of rising debt. And there are numerous headline risks, ranging from geopolitical concerns, trade conflict, and threats to central bank independence, to doubts whether central banks have the wherewithal to achieve price stability amid recession worries. With all this in mind, let me now ask our panelists in alphabetic order to make introductory remarks of up to five minutes each. After a brief discussion among the panelists, we'll then open the floor to questions from you in the audience. Dick? Thanks, Kim. And I want to echo Kim's uh, welcome to all of you, and thanks to the organizers, uh, KBRA and others, for supporting uh, this conference. Uh, Daryl's uh, comments uh, enable me to be pretty brief about mine because he's laid out a lot of the fundamentals that we think about uh, in credit markets, particularly with regard to, uh, to leverage lending. But let me just step back uh, a little bit. Um, and uh, maybe I should just say, look, as Ed pointed out, the current business and credit cycles 
have lasted a long time, more than a decade, both. We all know the reasons, or we think we know some of the reasons for, uh, for that longevity. But I think I want to try to answer today two questions. One is uh, something Daryl referred to, which is, could this credit cycle uh, trigger a financial crisis or a recession? Um, and second, how will this credit cycle differ from those uh, in the past? And just to anticipate uh, the discussion, um, like Daryl, I think that uh, there certainly are risks, but a, the significant increase in non-financial corporate leverage that we've seen is unlikely by itself to trigger a recession, much less a financial crisis. However, it does create vulnerabilities uh, and shocks, uh, we all know, can uh, result uh, in unintended consequences. Um, and uh, second, to anticipate again, uh, I think that the credit cycle dynamics in this uh, credit cycle are likely to be more intense uh, and likely to make any downturn in the economy uh, deeper and longer. So let's look at some of the reasons for that. Um, you know, some people, when they look at what's going on in CLOs and leverage lending, uh, make comparisons with uh, what we saw 11 years ago or 12 years ago with subprime CDOs. Uh, it seems to me those comparisons are not valid. Uh, the financial system is more resilient than it was 15 years ago. Uh, put differently, then we had both non-financial and financial leverage combined. Uh, and of course, non-financial leverage primarily through households that reached uh, extremes. And as Daryl pointed out, financial leverage is down considerably, at least in our banking system. And I'll comment on that uh, as well. So um, I think that the system is safer. Uh, notice I say safer, but not necessarily safe, uh, because what we've seen is a migration to some extent uh, in intermediation outside the banks into uh, non-bank uh, financial institutions and into markets. Um, I think that uh, when we think about the credit cycle itself, we think about the interplay with macro factors uh, that's really critical, and it expresses through uh, you know, concerns about, uh, or the lack thereof, about credit quality and its impact on the willingness to lend. Uh, the interplay um, with those uh, factors, uh, I think, manifests itself through, uh, through lending standards. Um, and we also know empirically that uh, the amplitude and duration of the credit cycle tends to exceed that in activity, but it also tends to amplify it. And I think that's likely to happen uh, this time around. Um, when we think about why this credit cycle is likely to be uh, different from the past, more intense and perhaps deeper and longer. It seems to me there are a few things uh, going on. Uh, one is uh, what I mentioned earlier. I'm concerned about uh, three factors related to our capital markets. First, non-bank uh, intermediation in the U.S. financial system is about half the uh, activity that we see overall. Um, and it is more opaque. We know less about it than we do about the banking system. We've done some work to try to measure uh, what's going on in those areas, but nonetheless, uh, we know less about it, and so that opacity tends to get in the way of our being able to analyze it. Second, I think we've seen fragmentation uh, and structural factors that have affected market liquidity. Not just regulation, but those factors, I think, may limit the flexibility of financial markets to absorb any shocks and increase their tendency to amplify them. So if there are price dislocations, if there are uh, downturns in price, uh, then it's going to be uh, more difficult for would-be buyers to come in uh, to uh, quickly take up uh, what they might see as attractive prices. And I think uh, probably less well known to many people, but uh, there's been a lot written about it, but one of the implications is the explosion in private markets, I think hides a lot of leverage that may intensify uh, intensify risk. Now, I'm a person who believes that there is a, uh, a, a, a terrific and important role for private uh, and public markets in our capital markets, and that achieving balance between them uh, is extremely important. But one of the things that we know uh, about private markets is that they are also opaque. 
And what we see going on in private markets is that uh, the leverage there, not just because of traditional ways of measuring leverage, but also because of adjustments to earnings uh, and because I think a lot of valuations or a lot of uh, uh, measures of leverage look at uh, debt to valuation rather than debt to EBITDA. And the consequence is that whereas uh, without adjustments you may see debt to EBITDA in some of these markets look like six times. If you backed out the adjustments to earnings, then they might look as high as eight times. Uh, so I think there's a lot more leverage uh, in private markets that uh, we're not quite aware of and that we're likely to find out about when there is a, a downturn. I'd also say that I think uh, global factors are much more important today than even a decade ago in the last crisis. The U.S. economy and U.S. credit markets are much more exposed to global factors. We all talk about the spillovers from the U.S. to uh, emerging markets and what's happening there. Uh, in both financial and non-financial terms. But I think it's important to recognize that uh, there are spillovers back to the U.S. markets uh, from what's going on uh, abroad. We see that today in the level of interest rates that Kim uh, alluded to. We see that today uh, in the way that shocks that are affecting uh, markets outside the United States uh, have an impact on our, on our markets. Uh, so despite nationalism and, and, uh, and fragmentation, I think cycles may well be more synchronized in the wake of the crisis than in the past. Um, and policy uh, is also more constrained than in the past. Central banks obviously have less policy space. If you judge it purely by interest rates or by the tools that they have available to them than they did prior uh, to the crisis. It's not that they completely lack the tools, far from it. Uh, but uh, they have less policy space now to address a downturn than before. And then there's a debate about the willingness and the space that uh, policymakers have uh, to use fiscal policy to address uh, a downturn. I'll just leave you with one metric, which I think is important. Uh, my colleague Rob Engel has developed something called S-Risk, which is a market price-based uh, measure uh, of the conditional uh, loss given a severe downturn in markets uh, for uh, global financial institutions. Um, and you can do this on a global basis because it's a dollar-based measure, uh, so you can add things up across the world. Global S-risk today is th at roughly the same level that it was, uh, or slightly higher uh, than it was during the crisis, uh, at $4 trillion. The difference, however, uh, underscores my point about global markets. A lot of it has shifted to, uh, to China and to Japan, uh, less so to uh, the United States. So when we think about looking at the risks in our markets uh, and the risks uh, globally, we need to take those factors into account. Thank you, Dick. Charlie? Okay. Uh, well, let me also say uh, thanks. Uh, it's always great to be back at NYU. Um, so I'm just going to try to hit three high-level points uh, that I always try to make whenever I you know, feel questions uh, from investors. Uh, about what I think uh, about the state of credit and credit markets. Um, so I'll, I'll list those quickly and then I'll kind of go through them. And I think in the, in the Q&A we're going to go around some of these same issues. But I'd say first and foremost, I always tell non-credit investors in particular, credit markets are better than you think, right? And by that I mean I think a lot of investors who don't really know about credit or and who view credit as kind of this mysterious black box that blew up one day and ruined, you know, the next couple of years of their lives, they view the credit market as, as this, you know, as this place where, where mysterious things happen this week. You know, it was the repo market, kind of a, you know, corollary to that uh, view, I think. But I actually think that as a result of some of the things that Daryl was talking about in his opening remarks, uh, as well as just the trauma that so many of the people in this room suffered after the crisis, that, that the excesses of credit risk taking uh, have been far less in this expansion, despite the length of it. Uh, than they were in the, in the previous expansion. Of course, regulators had a lot to do with that as well. And at the end of the day, if, if the banks aren't in the game, then, then nobody else can really play either. Um, the second point I want to make, um, because then people are disappointed, right? So you don't want to leave your, you know, your conversation, um, uh, your, your, uh, your clients disappointed. And so people say, well, then the next question is always, if you're not worried about credit, then what are you worried about? 
Uh, and so I came up with the bumper sticker, uh, liquidity is the new leverage, right? And, and, and so the idea there is, is just uh, that liquidity in the post-crisis period, whether it's OTC liquidity, which is never great, you know, even in a good day, or whether it's, you know, the most liquid markets and futures for S&P, E-Men or, or what have you, that I think liquidity for, for, for various reasons has, has become harder to supply to the markets uh, than it was pre-crisis. And again, some of that overlaps uh, Daryl's comments. I think in the OTC markets, you know, to be an OTC liquidity supplier is basically to run a massive hedge book which requires that you can do arbitrage cheaply, which benefits from leverage. It also requires um, that you can, uh, you know, that those ARBs don't cost money, right? That you're not paying capital charges on the gross exposures, you're, you're getting benefits of netting. And in the post-crisis period, the, all of the costs of running a hedge book have gone up fairly dramatically, right? So I think that that means basically it's harder for OTC markets to match buyers and sellers which means that in general, whenever you have a big, a big imbalance, it's gonna, it puts more of the burden on prices to kind of signal to the, you know, the sleepy other side of the market, okay, it's, there's stuff on sale here and you need to get going. Uh, but that used to happen pretty quickly by a combination of you know, dealer, broker dealers uh, and fast money in the hedge fund community who relied on broker dealer leverage. Uh, in the new environment, you know, that happens very sluggishly. It's an agency market, you know, not a principled market. So that's to be my second theme, and we can dig into that if, if people, if that's interesting to people. <clears throat> I think the other piece of the liquidity uh, concern that I have is that in the most liquid markets, where you kind of most take liquidity for granted, there's also been a sea change in the way that liquidity is supplied, right? In the sense that that's moved dramatically away from 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 dealer intermediation and and, and continued the trend uh, more sharply. Uh, toward having high frequency, you know, electronic uh, supply of, of liquidity. Uh, and I think in normal times, that's been a big improvement. I think that machines are much less, you know, they're emotion free. And I think in general, they do a much better job of supplying liquidity. And just to be clear, machines are the future. Uh, and I think, you know, that trend is here to stay. And the question is just how good can machines get at, at that job? But I think you know, in this interim period where we're still kind of figuring out how to, how to design a machine to supply liquidity, it works great in normal times, but in, in periods of crisis and big declines, there's evidence that suggests that machines are not as good as people. And the reason is because machines can't handle ambiguity, whereas people can. So you know, what the evidence suggests uh, is that in periods of you know, these uh, flash crashes and other periods when there's kind of big ambiguous uh, information in the market, I think, you know, everybody pulls back, right? Humans and machines both pull liquidity away from the, from the markets in times like that, but the machines pull away more because they can't process the information that's in the headlines, right? And, and, and someday machines will be better at this than they are currently, but, you know, if you talk to any uh, high frequency uh, trading, so, you know, manager, they'll say, well, in the old days, we just had a switch and we would just turn it off when we started to lose money and we saw a headline. He goes, these days we're, we're getting smarter and we see that some of the, a lot of those days are actually days we can make a lot of money. But it's still the case that a trader whose job it was basically to process fundamental information about the shocks that are hitting the market on a regular basis is normally going to be better informed, better equipped to handle a weird headline uh, than a machine that's just seeing, you know, the flow, just seeing uh, the flow. So I actually think that uh, we're seeing more of these flash crashes and we're seeing in the, in the most liquid markets, not the credit markets, but the most liquid markets uh, are where these flash crashes have kind of started to pop up in the post-crisis period. I think it's basically because we have uninformed, you know, uh, again, agency-driven uh, types of liquidity suppliers uh, dominating these markets today. And then the final uh, comment I would make is that uh, I'm a, I'm a, in a camp that think that low rates are here to stay uh, and that it's not the Fed's fault uh, that the low rate environment, which has driven so many of the concerns that, you know, the credit investors have about the search for yield and where that goes. But also, you know, I had, a di I had dinner last night with a CIO of a, of a big insurance company, and this was the entire conversation over dinner. Was, you know, they're, they're desperate for yield, uh, as, many, as I'm sure many of you in this room are, and trying to figure out what's the best way to, you know, to, to satisfy their liabilities without doing stupid stuff. Uh, KKR is well positioned, I think, uh, to benefit from some of that. That was kind of one of the punchlines we came away with. with private, going privates and going less liquid for certain types of investors will be the answer, I think. 
Um, but I think, you know, more fundamentally, to understand why we're in this low rate environment and, and why the yield curve, for example, is currently inverted, my own view is that you have to look, again, to global factors and not U.S. factors. I think it's a very disorienting period, but my view is that, you know, the global capital markets are just one big, you know, one big pond and water finds its level. Uh, and, and I think a little known fact that I like to tickle people with is that if you compute three-month real rates for the U.S. and for the rest of the developed markets, and then you calculate an average of the of developed market real rates excluding the U.S., and then just plot those two lines over the last 30 years and plot the gap, call that the real yield gap between the U.S. and the rest of the world, that gap today is at a 30-year high. 30-year high, right? So in the, in the you know in the big debate you know between the Fed and Trump let's say uh, or be, among clients that I talk to about whether you know rates are too high or too low uh, or what is R star is another way to frame that conversation I always think to myself well isn't R star kind of the the real rate that things are supposed to settle out to once you know global capital flows have had a chance to arb away all the relative opportunities. Uh, and shouldn't we be looking to global signals uh, pretty pretty aggressively to get some sense of where the global supply and demand for capital is settling out? And the answer is, globally, it's settling out at minus two, minus two real. And so, you know, at US, you know in the U.S., we were headed for plus one real, and now we're back to call it zero-ish, but we're still high relative to the rest of the world. So we're still in a situation where the, the U.S., which has historically been a borrow currency like the yen, is actually a carry currency, which is a you know which is a weird place to be, uh, if you think that we're the you know the safest uh, supplier of global capital. So I, my own view is that rates are going lower, not higher, uh, and that's that's not a comment on whether it's appropriate to the U.S. business cycle or not. It's a comment on where I think our star sits, and also so that that has implications obviously for how credit investors should be thinking about yield going forward. But we'll table that, and I'll pass it on. Thank you, Charlie. Dave. Okay. Well, <clears throat> thanks, Charlie, for stealing my thunder. Um, <laughs> I was trying to give you a pass. <laughs> uh, in all seriousness, though, uh, Kim, thank you for the introduction. Thank you to Kroll and NYU for the invitation to speak. It's an honor to bad cleanup for this lineup here. Um, what I plan to drive towards in about a minute is our forward-looking investment orientation at KKR. Uh, but to establish that, I think it actually helps to look backwards for a couple of minutes as well. Uh, so I started at, at KKR back in 2011 with my team. I think that was partially the result of some lessons learned at the firm coming out of the financial crisis. Uh, and so one of the first tasks that we had when we arrived was to advise the firm on, on the cycle and, and its potential duration. And what we advised them at the time was that things really looked quite robust, um, but that what we would be wise to do, we thought, would be to plan for a mild recession at some point late this decade, um, potentially around now-ish. Um, and let me give you a sense of the factors that we were focused on when we, when we came up with that advice. It would be, first of all, we thought it would be around now that you'd get to um, labor markets that had absorbed most of their slack, um, similarly within manufacturing. We thought it would be around now that you would have had the Fed remove a lot of the accommodation that was in place um, and we also thought, we, we saw some fracturing of, of global trade and the consensus around expanding exports as a percentage of GDP as a driver of prosperity. And we're concerned that that could be a catalyst for the next cycle. Um, so here we are today, and I'd say actually a lot of these things have, have played out. Um, there's been a recession thus far. Um, and most, maybe the most interesting piece of the puzzle, though, is that in a lot of parts of markets, You've, you've actually been paid to position as though that recession is, is imminent. Um, you don't see that in leverage lending, you know, in a lot of pockets, and we've discussed that, but we could focus as well as, you know, you've certainly been paid to be dovish on, on interest rates. Uh, you've been paid to favor growth over value uh, within both credit and equity markets. Uh, you've been paid to be quite skeptical and cautious on commodities, and you've been paid to um, demand a really healthy risk premium for taking risk in emerging markets. Um, so these, these were all quite cautious elements of positioning that have, have been rewarded. Um, so how, how do I think that this came to pass? I'd, I'd highlight a couple of things. Um, first of all, I think that we've had a, a series of, of rolling mini recessions already this cycle, whether it was 2011, 12 in Europe, 
um, 15 and 16 with the, with the oil crisis, um, and here we are in 18 and 19 now with, with US-China trade really putting a damper on things. Uh, and what I think that that's done is within the real economy, it served to keep things from getting too extended. Um, so I would highlight things like corporate capital investment, um, housing starts, household formation, um, construction investment, many of these things, when we look at them, they look more mid-cycle as a percentage of GDP than late cycle. And I think that these rolling mini recessions have a lot to do with that. Um, and then within financial markets, I'd highlight the macro prudential regulation that's come into place. And Professor Duffy has already addressed that more eloquently than, than I could. But in, in addition to sort of the bank specific regulation, I'd also highlight the tightening down of mortgage lending standards, which is really um, had a, a major impact on, on big parts of capital markets, housing in particular. So what that's done in financial markets, I think, is to keep a lot of areas from getting too overextended. Now, of course, there are pockets of, of excess exuberance, and I imagine we'll get to those before too long. Um, but overall, I'd say that most areas of financial, uh, financial markets do not look as concerning as they would have, you know, circa 2006, 2000 to us, and I think it's these factors that, that, um, that drive that. So where does that leave us oriented going forward? Um, you know, our base case at the moment is really more of the same, which is that we continue to have relatively vibrant services sectors within developed markets driven by healthy labor markets, um, but that CapEx-driven industries remain pretty fragile and trade-linked industries as well. Uh, I think we continue to see a fracturing of global trade patterns, and I'd say that really regardless of what the outcome is on the, the current U.S.-China negotiations. Um, I'd say, I'd highlight briefly that that adds a tailwind to an important theme for us at KKR, which is deconglomeratization as an important area of, of opportunity, just basically that corporate carve-outs um, are going to continue to be an area of focus. Um, Getting a little bit more optimistic, I, we feel pretty good about household formation from this point in the cycle. It feels like we're just getting to a point where unemployment has been low enough for a sufficiently long time. And also with this rate of, of finally much lower mortgage rates and, and somewhat easing of mortgage lending standards could, could, could help things there. And then the final theme that I would just highlight that I think actually is sort of a sub-theme to so much of, of what's been mentioned in this room already, but it's the aging demographics and slowing population growth. I think that's gotta be a key element for your model, whether you're thinking about rates or positioning within real estate markets or your inflation forecasting or your thematic drivers of a lot of investments. And that's, that's a key area of focus for us. So with that, I'll pause and look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Dave. Um, since this is the panel focused on the economic outlook, I'm just gonna ask you all to put your money on the table. Um, in the following sense, um, I'd like you to tell me what probability you assign to the likelihood of a U.S. recession in the next 12 months and why. So I'll start. I'm probably the bear in the room. Um, I uh, would say it's, it's between 50 and 60 percent over the next 12 months. And I think the primary reason is uh, a factor that we're all aware of, namely uncertainty over uh, the trade environment that is uh, having an impact on not just U.S., but also global activity. The spillover from uh, what we might see globally, I think, is, uh, is important um, and having an impact on, uh, on the U.S. Notwithstanding the fact that uh, things that uh, both the data and that some of the domestic sectors that we've discussed look okay, it seems to me that we should not ignore the idea that uh, when uh, parts of the economy look weak uh, and when shocks uh, hit uh, the economy as a whole and hit financial markets, uh, that, uh, you know, that's likely to spill over into other parts of the economy. So uh, slowing growth in employment, uh, slowing growth in, uh, in incomes, uh, uncertainty about uh, the policy environment, I think, is likely to affect not just businesses but ultimately uh, consumers. And uh, therefore, I'd say we're a shock away from uh, a modest downturn. Great. I'm going to go, uh, I'm going to take the under since you made a, <laughs> gave me a nice high number. I, I would put it more like 30. 
Uh, I think the probability of a slump or, or you know, a, a, a slowdown that feels bad is pretty high, and I would argue we're almost we're there's we're already there globally, and I think there's a good chance the U.S. will follow. But I think the recession probability uh, is lower if you're using the formal definition, mainly because I think the Fed has been pretty nimble, uh, and and I think uh, probably relative to past late cycle. You know, if you look at past late cycle periods like the one we're in currently, where unemployment is as low as this, if you'd have told me unemployment was going to, you know, land in the threes and the, and the Fed was going to be cutting, you know, 20, 50 basis points, I would have said no chance, you know, five years ago. Uh, but having seen, you know, how weak global growth seems to be and having seen how, you know, well anchored inflation seems to be, I think they're doing the right thing uh, by kind of looking ahead and getting out in front of uh, some of the, you know, the weakness from, from trade concerns and, and so forth uh, and putting in a little bit of a, you know, insurance buffer and I think also, you know, kind of listening to the yield curve, which to my mind is, is telling, you know, telling us something we're supposed to be listening to, which is that U.S. short rates are too high, right? And um, so, but I, again, I think, uh, w you know, the reason it's as high as 30 in my mind is because, you know, the Fed didn't jump right away. I've been, you know, I wrote a note uh, early last fall where I started, you know, I was pointing out that real rates look pretty high in the U.S. relative to anywhere else in the world, and that seemed like a problem. Um, but we're sort of heading in the right direction. The question is whether the Fed is going to take us there fast enough. Yep. Um, so we've got um, probit models for recession probability. One looks out a year, one looks out two. Uh, the one-year model currently pegs the recession probability around 40 to 45 percent, and the two years around 60 percent. Um, the the key drivers that are sort of adding a lot of weight there would be um, number one, the yield curve, and number two, um, sort of the corporate credit conditions that we've discussed at some length already. Uh, and what's a really critical driver pulling it down is consumer credit conditions, so both consumer leverage and also um, consumer uh, default behavior looking really benign at the moment. Um, so if anything changed in the consumer picture, our, our recession odds would, would ratchet up real fast. Um, moving from those sort of probit models to more of like leading indicators, um, I'd say we're in a very similar camp to what, what Charlie uh, espoused, which is it, it, there's actually a mini recession going on right now, and it likely continues to feel pretty bad. Um, for, for another six to nine months or so. Um, and then our, our models start to get a little bit better late next year. And the things that help are, are the Fed easing that's taking place right now, um, lower oil prices starting to help consumers uh, a little bit, and then also some incipient better behavior in housing markets, which, which also seem to be the result of, of lower rates. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask one more question. We're going to ask each of you, the audience who have questions, if you would please line up in the aisles near the cameras uh, for those who have the microphones. We'll get to your questions in a moment, but please line up so we can um, rank order the questions. Um, I wanted to follow up on something that Charlie said, which I thought uh, is interesting, and I'm not sure, I've been wondering about its consistency with something you said later. Um, you were suggesting that this minus 2% real rate that we observe in the globe may be sort of the magnet that we're effectively being drawn down to. And if our star, the equilibrium real interest rate, is something like minus 2, do central banks really have the, the ability right now to ensure that we are going to achieve price stability defined in the way they like to, namely a 2% inflation target? Yeah, I mean, it obviously makes the job harder as you get close to zero, and I think... Uh, you know, it's, it, you know, since you mentioned it, to the extent that there, you know, there are countries around the world that are constrained from setting real rates even lower, right, the gap is even bigger than it looks, right, bigger than it measures. Uh, but yeah, I think, um, you know, if you could rerun history, it's not easy to go from a 2% target to a 4%, but at, at one point, 4 was actually pretty actively debated. Uh, for inflation. Fed, for, for an inflation target. Right. And obviously, the lower you think you're going to be in terms of the Let's say there's some fundamental real rate equilibrium in the global economy, which I think you know demographics have a lot to do with, right? It, and there's a ton of interesting. I mean, I'm sure people in this room are aware of it, but there is just a ton of interesting research happening now that kind of suggests, you know, the biggest problem we're going to have that our kids' generation is going to have is going to be demographic decline, as opposed to you know overpopulation. And I think um, I think Japan is a preview of that, uh, and all the problems that Japan monetary policy has had. There's also a preview of where I think 
you know, on current trends, it looks like the rest of the world is, is going to end up. So, you know, I'm not, that, that's my kind of my base case, but I, I, there's a lot of risk right up. My conviction's not super high because there's lots of things that could spring us out of this trajectory, not least, you know, productivity breakthroughs. And, you know, I have a lot of technology op optimists in my, in my life who tell me, you know, that we're on the verge of a, you know, of a big non-singularity and so forth. So, you know, something's, like, something is going to have to drive up the demand for capital in a world where, you know, guys like me look at our, you know, savings accounts and I calculate, you know, my one, I just did this this week with my, you know, advisor, my 1% muni yield and I'm thinking, okay, honey, you know, <laughs> here's the budget for the rest of our life if I hit retirement. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's like... You have to save more, yeah, Charlie. Yeah, it, it's, not, it's not bullish for consumption, you know, it's like... So, so I, anyway, that's all just to say that the, the, the levers that, you know, the monetary policy could pull. I mean, the, I, I sort of, that, that came to my mind because there's been this debate a little bit in the media and there's some, some academics that have looked at, you know, the, the counterintuitive effects of low rates that, in fact, it means that you have to save more, not less. It's the, you know, the income effect dominates. And I think that, uh, to me, it's not the Fed's fault. It's just the fault of this of this crazy equilibrium that we're in where we have way more people saving for retirement than we have, you know, building more stuff for us all to uh, consume. Dave, Dick, Dave, do you sure. want to? Sure, uh, you know, let me fill in on that because I think for the first time in four years, we've seen a real disconnect between uh, two variables that we thought were pretty well linked, namely the personal saving rate in the United States uh, and net worth relative to, uh, to income or to GDP. Um, and saving rates have gone up, uh, hovering in the seven to eight percent range. Uh, you know, uh, in, in my experience, there were plenty of times when net worth was rising, when this personal saving rate, as, as flawed a measure as it is, um, you know, could be as low as uh, one or two percent. Uh, it seemed to get revised up all the time, but nonetheless, uh, those two things were closely connected. And I think the disconnect in part reflects caution on the part of consumers in the post-crisis world. Um, I think it reflects uh, a growing, uh, albeit still insufficient and slow, realization that, uh, just as Charlie was saying, you know, uh, current rates of return, we better save more uh, in order to uh, retire. And of course, lots of people, uh, including uh, me, uh, are retiring later, and I'm sure that many people in this room are thinking the same thing. So you put that, that all together, uh, and that caution is one of the things that uh, that I think is important. Uh, you know, some of the things we've talked about also evince um, maybe some differences in our views on uh, the monetary policy um, or transmission mechanism between interest rates uh, and economic activity. And uh, we still don't know a lot about that, but it, but it seems to me that a lot of the things we're talking about mean that uh, it takes more monetary policy firepower to get the same uh, impact on the economy than uh, prior to the crisis. And if that's true, uh, then I think uh, it's going to take a lot more on the part of central banks and then we run into that minus 2% real uh, uh, problem that uh, is going to limit the ability of central banks to respond. So what's the answer? I think the answer ought to be uh, not just more fiscal stimulus, but a change in our fiscal stimulus over the long term uh, that uh, focuses on things that help productivity growth, like uh, perhaps infrastructure, education, uh, and uh, others for the long term. Uh, everything that, that Dick and Charlie said resonates deeply. So uh, I guess the one thing that I would add is that, well, Europe and Japan certainly feel like the ghost of Christmas future for, for the United States in terms of rates and, and monetary policy. There is one distinction that I think sort of helps them you know, slow the, the, the path for that of the U.S., which is, you have to focus on uh, the FX environment as well, which is when we look at Europe and Japan, uh, the currencies there look really unusually weak relative to purchasing power parity. Um, and that has important implications, I think, for rates markets as well, which is for anyone who would sort of want to protest and leave, they have to reckon with the fact that they could be coming back into a stronger currency one day and really give up any of their gains. Um, that's not so much the case for the U.S. And so I think for, for those who are concerned about crashing into negative rates really fast in the U.S., I think you would have to see some FX equalization before that happened. Could I just make two quick comments uh, on that as well? So, you know, what uh, Dave and Charlie are talking about, obviously, uh, and you're all aware of this, has resulted in a stronger currency. Uh, 
Um, and while that's not the dominant factor necessarily in uh, our share of the global economy, nonetheless, a stronger dollar is going to have be a, a restraint, uh, and will um, you know will tighten financial conditions in the United States. So the, that's something that. Uh, you know, monetary policy changes will obviously uh, have the capacity to unwind, but it is something um, to think about. And as other rates are negative, um, you know, if U.S. policymakers are reluctant to take rates uh, down completely, then, um, you know, that, that's something to think about. The second thing is that this is an environment where we're talking about uh, a search for yield. Um, and the longer we stay here, uh, the more that vulnerabilities build up in, in the financial system, in my view. Um, you couple that with the fact that we've seen a move towards uh, what Dan Turillo calls low-intensity deregulation, um, which adds to risk-taking in, in our economy, in my view. We can all debate where the balance ought to be between safety soundness on one hand and resilience and you know, efficient, effective, and appropriately tailored on the other. But it seems to me we're moving uh, more towards the latter than the former, um, and that seems to me to increase the chances that uh, we will have some consequences for the economy and potentially for the financial system. Great. So now we'll start to take questions from the audience. I'm going to be begin on the left wing. So please. Um, hi. This question is for Charlie. I know you spend a lot of time with investors, and it would be easy, very easy for you to talk about the uh, most common questions and concerns you've heard from them in recent months. But what I'd really like to hear you address are, what are the least frequent but most thought-provoking questions you've heard from investors recently, um, and what are the out-of-consensus concerns? Thanks. I know Donna, and you could have given me a little heads up on that one if you were <laughs> <laughs> um, That's a good question. I, I don't know that I really heard anything that wasn't um, kind of in the, you know, in, the, in, the, in the newspapers every day that's really made me sit up and say, oh, that's something I, you know, I hadn't thought about. It's not that I thought of everything, but um, I'm actually kind of mute on that one. Sorry to disappoint. Maybe come back to it. Dave, yeah, I don't if know. If it you hits to, me, I'll grab you at the You want to take a shot? You know, I, I think that, you know, there, there's so much focus on, on global events, but a lot of it has come down to sort of trade and fiscal policy as an impulse, and, and the geopolitical um, hasn't gotten much emphasis. And so I'd say, you know, it, it's some of these exogenous shocks from what we saw in Saudi Arabia this week. It, you know, that, that's a potential spark um, that, that we should be focused on. Maybe I'll uh, just add, you know, we started to focus more on climate, um, geopolitical, and cyber risks uh, as things that could destabilize the financial system and, um, and markets, and for that matter, the economy. So some of the questions that I get are, well, what do you think the linkages are between shocks in those areas and, uh, and the economy? The answer is, they don't sound good, uh, but... Uh, uh, we don't know, and that's why we're uh, starting to do more work in those areas. Great. Now, f now for the right wing. Uh, th thank you for your comments, gentlemen. <clears throat> My question is for Mr. Himmelberg. You mentioned that you believe low interest rates are here to stay. I happen to agree. My question would be, do you believe that negative interest rates are here to stay in Europe? And if so, what are the implications for European financial institutions operating long-term in an environment of negative interest rates. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I mean, that's obviously a, a, at the very front end of the curve, a policy decision. And I guess my, my sense, especially given the tiering in the last round of, uh, you know, policy, uh, policy decisions, is that they're trying to be sensitive to the plight of financial intermediaries, and especially in a bank-dominated economy like Europe, you can't, you can't, tax the banks, so to speak, uh, and not, you know, suffer the consequences. So I have a general view that, you know, that uh, essentially what monetary policy needs to do is find ways to kind of subsidize banks. And, you know, if you think of banks as maturity transformation, you know, engines in the economy, then basically you need to find ways to supply cheaper funding um, and make sure that there's still a little bit of a NIM and credit pickup on their, on their asset side of their balance sheet so that credit creation doesn't just stop, um, or at least it, you know, is there to meet whatever demand shows up. I think, um, 
So, you know, so obviously in the case of negative rates, the question is whether, you know, whether you question, I mean, there's questions we haven't fully explored. I forget, was it in Switzerland this week that I saw that deposit rates are they're now, the Swiss bank was now de charging for deposits. And, you know, we'll find out if that's going to be, you know, a sustainable equilibrium where depositors are willing to accept, you know, minus a half or minus 1% returns on deposits just to have, you know, a safe, you know, nest egg. Uh, but ultimately, it, it seems to me the monetary policy won't have any choice other than to sort of think about whether, you know, these various policy tools, instruments are, are helping or hurting as far as credit creation goes. And just as an aside, you know, on that point, I personally am a much bigger fan of policy tools like either, you know, inflation, like price level targets that sort of help get inflation expectations up or um, forward guidance type tools that kind of tell banks, you know, you can, you can fund long term at, at by rolling overnight rates uh, and that's and there's no risk to that but I, I think that that's that's obviously a big boost to credit creation to, through the uh, banking system whereas things like QE are very ambiguous in my mind because if you kind of depress the long end of the curve you're you're compressing the the return on credit on the credit supply and it seems that you know I'm not saying that that w wasn't useful during the crisis I think it was as a signaling device but I think when you're thinking on a sustained basis about how does the how does the credit continue to flow to the real economy? I think you have to make sure that you know people can still make money, you know, supplying it. So great. Um, back to the left. Uh, thanks for the chance to ask, ask this question. So um, this question is really for anyone that would like to uh, take a swing at it. Um, I think we can all agree that we've been seeing some unprecedented political influence from the White House on the Fed and the direction of interest rates and the speed of move. So in analyzing portfolio allocation, I always like to play this what if game. So what if the Fed last week were to have sort of bucked market anticipation and had done something rather radical, uh, i.e. make a move that is more consistent with what say the White House would like to have seen. So what do we think the market's shape would be in the event we did see some radical shift in rates to, to lower and its immediate effect on the overall marketplace. Great. Dave, maybe I could ask you to take the first shot. Yeah, happy to take a crack, which is, um, you know, look, I don't, I don't think it's helped the situation that for the past year or so, President Trump has had a point. Um, and so that, that's almost the most dangerous part of it. Um, but where I think the rubber hits the road and markets get concerned about it is when you have you know, executive branch desires for monetary policy that are completely at odds with what the prudent thing is for the real economy. Um, you know, so for example, at a time where, you know, inflation is still low, but within credit markets, things are really frothy. So if things look like 2006, I think that that's a real problem. Or, you know, when, inflate, when, when the real economy is slow, but inflation is a problem and the Fed has to deal with that. These are all places where the executive branch interference is a real problem. And what I would just plant in, everyone's heads is, you know, what would President Trump have tweeted about Paul Volcker in, in 1981? Um, so I, I don't think it's a, a huge issue at the moment, but it could become one. Charlie or Dick? I wouldn't differ a lot from that. I'd just say, um, you know, in the United States, uh, we have enjoyed for a long period after the Second World War, the so-called exorbitant privilege of having our, our dollar be the reserve currency of the world. That's not likely to change anytime soon, uh, but give it time uh, and uh, couple it with uh, a number of changes in the political environment, um, you could see people start to question whether or not that's the case and whether or not investors want to reallocate uh, to other parts of the world uh, if they judge them to be safer. Great. Um, right side. Uh, hi, thanks. Just Profound comments, uh, great, great job, very well-informed panel. It's wonderful to hear you. I'm going to ask a more pedestrian question, which is, do you see areas of embedded leverage in the economy? We see, for example, the Wee Company, which is many people have described as a, as a bank in, in all uh, respects. Uh, it's not financed heavily in the credit markets, uh, but are there other areas, uh, the Lending Tree and other, other companies, non-bank banks, or Financial company, non-financial companies that are essentially banks in the economy that might uh, pose a vulnerability in the case we have a slowdown. 
Um, I think the question was essentially whether there are uh, non-bank financials that are essentially a source of risk uh, to the financial system. Uh, is that a fair way to put it? Or the economy. Or the economy. Dick? Jamie, thanks for your question. Um, and I alluded to this in the past uh, in some of my comments. Uh, the problem is that we have less information about uh, where that might be. Uh, those markets tend to be a little more opaque. Uh, we've done some work to you know, try to understand that. We need to do more. Uh, but intermediation does tend to go where you know, the cost of funding is lowest and where the uh, regulation is, uh, is lowest um, and where the opacity may be greatest. And so uh, I, I am concerned about, uh, particularly in private markets, uh, where there might be hidden leverage, there might be hidden excess. Uh, not greatly concerned. I don't think it's going to be the cause of the next crisis. But nonetheless, I think it may um, lengthen and, and uh, when shocks hit, it may lengthen and uh, extend and deepen the, uh, the next downturn. Yeah, I'll, I'll take a crack. I mean, I've, I've spent a lot of time trying to, you know, scrounge around for examples of embedded leverage that seems, you know, like, uh, like it's excessive and I haven't found any. If anybody knows of some in the room, tell me because I'd like to have some. <laughs> but. Um, <laughs> But my, the, the closest I've been able to come in my own mind is, is this idea that, you know, as you sort of slump into a low vol world and a low return world where carry in general becomes like a very attractive, you know, source of income. It's not high, but it's better than zero. I do think that, you know, maybe crowding of trades uh, into high carry, you know, strategies as an example. And, you know, I, I have a couple friends who, you know, in the, on the buy side who run, you know, vol you know, vol selling type strategies and things, you know, carry type things that are fine nine years out of 10 until they're not, that kind of stuff. I mean, it's, it's you know, and I think Dick alluded to this earlier too, it's hard not to believe that those aren't gonna eventually become just too tempting to resist because, you know, you're being paid to earn returns for, for investors. Charlie and just reminded me of something yeah. that I, I think is important. Yeah. You know, back in the, um, in the 80s uh, at Solomon Brothers, we talked about currency hedge bond investing. Um, because re yield curves, uh, the slope of yield curves and rate differentials were very conducive for that. So you could uh, take a, a bond that had a low return and juice it up by 150, 200 basis points by using a three-month rolling currency well, hedge. right now. <laughs> and, and it's working right now. Uh, but as Charlie's pointing out, the problem with that uh, is that when the currency hedge goes away, uh, then you're exposed to currency risk and basis risk. Uh, and so think of it as a three month, not a 10 year instrument. Yeah. Um, I guess my disclaimer is I work for a, for a company that does plenty of uh, non-bank lending. So I have a distinct point of view. Um, what, I, what I think should make folks feel better is first of all, that a lot of the companies that are doing this, ourselves included, the capital is pretty expensive. Um, so it doesn't lend the, itself to the sort of excesses that, that you see with some of these trades that Dick and Charlie have mentioned. It's, it's not a picking up nickels in front of a steamroller kind of business. Um, so I think that's been salutary. Uh, that, that said, I, I certainly think it, it would be healthy to, to have more, more data on the industry. It'd be welcome, you know, even by participants. Um, and I also think that it, it, it does make sense to shine a, to shine a spotlight on some of these accounting adjustments to EBITDA, we see a little bit more of that, and I, I don't think that's particularly healthy. Great, Ethan. Yeah, um, question on the Phillips curve. So we've seen basically a declaration that the Phillips curve no longer is really relevant in monetary policy. If that's if you agree to that, why do you think that the Fed reducing interest rates again or flooding the market with more liquidity will have any impact or help the situation that we're in? So I, I'll, I'll take a crack. I mean, I don't think the Phillips curve is dead um, as much as I just think inflation expectations have become, you know, supremely well anchored and for lots of good reasons. Um, and it's the first time really, if you think about it, that, you know, in history that we've been in this situation, right? They spent, we spent, you know, up, uh, you know, inflation, Inflation targets by central banks are a modern development. We take them for granted like they've been around forever, but they, they, they were not a thing when I was teaching macro here at NYU in the early 90s, right? That, that, that it, you know, it came about in the late 90s that it kind of became semi-institutionalized. And then, you know, we spent, we've spent 20 years kind of getting used to this low inflation environment, we, but in particular, we've got used to this idea that the, inf that the inflation rate is going to settle in at 2% because that's what the, you know, central bank wants. So I, 
my guess is that the reason inflation relationships to the real economy have broken down is because those expectations have really come to dominate uh, behavior. Um, and then I think, the, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. Great. Actually, we have time for Professor Figluski. Um, in all these discussions, uh, as, as we see them in the newspaper and in the, these types of forums, um, and there are a couple of, kind of statistics or measures that, that everybody uses that I personally find kind of ambiguous, and I'd be really interested to hear what you guys think about this. One of them is the idea of an inverted yield curve. Now, I can certainly think of situations uh, where uh, an inverted yield curve would be a precursor of a recession, but I've been in the futures area for a long time, and I've seen all kinds of discussions of technical trading patterns and so forth that are supposed to be very meaningful. Is the inverted yield curve anything more than a head and shoulders pattern? So that's my first question. <laughs> <laughs> the second question has to do with how we, our measure of economic discomfort as uh, an NBER recession, two quarters of negative real growth. Um, is that an adequate measure of the kind of economic unpleasantness that uh, we may be facing if we don't have two quarters, if we have, or if we have minus 5% one quarter and plus 1% the next quarter, is that not a, a recession? Uh, I was pleased to hear Charlie uh, Himmelberg's uh, comment that, uh, well, things could happen that really aren't so, not officially recessions, but still are pretty unpleasant. So I'd be really interested to hear what you guys have to say about either or both of those, how we should interpret these things. Um, maybe I'll start quickly. Um, first on the inverted yield curve, it seems to me that uh, when people look at it, it's correlation with recession probabilities. There's no question that that's been the case in the past. To me, it's more symptom than cause. Uh, and why we get to recessions or what, what actually causes the recession as opposed to the inverted yield curve itself, that, I think that's really the issue. So Ben Bernanke was fond of saying, you know, recessions happen when the Fed murders the economy to bring inflation down. Uh, we don't have, obviously, an inflation problem uh, cu currently, nor do I think we're going to have one quickly, uh, so I agree there with, with Charlie. Uh, on the second point, uh, I completely agree that we can have economic circumstances that don't involve uh, the economy turning down, uh, but nonetheless being unpleasant in certain <coughs> ways. And a very slow growth economy, um, you know, can be very unpleasant. We typically think about that being an environment in which the unemployment rate will go up, people will lose their jobs, there may be parts of the economy that are weak. Um, and frankly, it's one in which income inequality is likely to intensify. Anybody else? Yeah, I would just flag that. I mean, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned head and shoulders because that's actually a lot of what the yield curves looked like um, for a lot of the past six months where you know, it's been inverted from, from Fed funds out to two years, but then positively sloping beyond that. So it struck us largely as, as a money market's expression of where they think Fed funds is heading rather than, you know, a, a, a continuously inverted curve reflecting that, hey, the future looks a lot worse than, than the present. So, you know, as, as I mentioned, it, it factors into our models and, and it, it is something of a concern, but not a, not a flashing red light in our view. Yeah, the, the, the observation I always like to make on, on, on yield curve inversions is that uh, there's some work at the board by Eric Engstrom, and I forget his co-author, but Eric was a student of mine, so I remember him. But, and they were look, kind of looking at which spread works best, right? And, and they, they sort of came up with the three-month, 18-month forward spot spread, with the, the, the near curve, uh, the near-term uh, yield spread. Uh, as being a more robust uh, indicator than like um, the three-month tenure, which is kind of the, no the usual favorite. And I think that's relevant because one of the pushbacks against the yield curve as an indicator, I'm a, I'm a believer that you're supposed to respect it. Um, but one pushback is, well, you know, term premium have changed a lot. They used to be plus one or two, and now they're like negative 50 or whatever. And so you can't, they don't really tell you the same thing about the, you know, they don't signal the same thing about the, where the forward expectations are the way they used to. But at the front end, that's much less of an issue, uh, and I think you know, and I think uh, the fact that that works better empirically suggests that you know, you can look at that instead. And just for the record, it's it's you know one of the most persistently in inverted uh, parts of the curve uh, recently, which is essentially saying the market is pretty convinced that over the next 18 months, the Fed is going to have to cut more, not less. Uh, and the market can always be wrong, and half the time it is. Uh, 
but I think uh, you know my own view is that the market is right you know, um, in this case. As, as for as for the you know the other, the, I'd say you raise a super interesting question. I think that the uh, about the you know whether recession is an indicator of malaise or not. I mean it will be of course if we if we have an actual recession, but. There is, you know, on this point about wealth inequality, I think a, a bit of uh, sentiment differential between, you know, savers and, and workers um, who are living hand to mouth. And times are pretty good. They're not great. But if you're, if you're, if you're you know, if you're in the, in the labor economy uh, and you're living paycheck to paycheck, you know, the fact that jobs are plentiful, you know, in excess demand of supply and that wages are crawling up in real terms finally, you know, it feels pretty good, and I think that's why sentiment measures, you know, consumer sentiment measures are, um, are at their all-time highs. But you survey a group of MDs at Goldman Sachs, and sentiment is not great. <laughs> Has so, a lot to do with Daryl's uh, balance sheet so, contractions. But, yeah. so, sorry, to, sorry to cut you off. I, uh, I promised Ed that we would finish at 11. I'm blaming the extra two minutes on the fire drill. Please join me in, please join me in thanking our distinguished panelists. <laughs>